Danse. Jen Ladrut, Nitsi Kason. Igua Gift Lake, Alberta, Hochinia. We are had to Moyanoma Gayas. Mr. Hikwani Pigisksin, Kagi Piawas, Siwian. Nineteen fifties, Niki Huapatin. Igua Hicks Pigit Lake. Matunaya. Mucha quantity is a gaki gihui giak. Muiki guaiki tena, aya. Miss Kanawa, Ochimio Asana, mean moi meti, I seen what Ochutapan ask we were to squat Tuhpito Nando di Tuhtito. Makwendo Hayana no he, the Wichasiki way. Give must a guapiganan and give must aya. Puni nan Magam stay queen igusksin. Igwan nipak simon tami wih tami kuhe kawya ha chamoyan. Hi, my name is Jen Ladderoot and I'm from Gift Lake, Alberta. And I'm going to be uh, talking, I'm going to be doing some videos on YouTube. Uh, about life uh, as I recall from when I was a child and I was a child in the 1950s. I saw life in the 1950s and how people lived, how the community was, how, how things were done. And so it is my hope that you enjoy these stories. Today I will be talking about uh, health care or the lack of health care we had. But our health care came from our mother. This is a tribute to my mother to talk about this because I remember that she was a wonderful doctor, a good doctor with a wonderful bedside manner. And she took care of us. She had the patience and t made the time to, to look after a sick child or several sick children at a time. Um, she was on call 24-7, 365. She had to be ready to deal with any emergency. A and she did. Um, I clearly remember the times, you know, that um, she, just put everything aside and took care of us. And she worked with whatever was available. She used whatever was available because that was how life was back then. Uh, she didn't necessarily have a fully stocked uh, medicine cabinet, but she, don't, she didn't only look in the medicine cabinet for how to treat us. It was other ways that she had learned and been taught. Now, my mom did not use traditional medicines very much. She was in a residential school and there they were made to believe that uh, it was an evil practice to harvest traditional medicines from, from uh, nature because there is a spiritual component to doing that. So she was not exposed to this important part of our culture. She did, however, learn and practice some of the residential school health practices, and she used them on us. I will make references to them a couple of times. I do recall that she would use rat root, uh, gupagua. Um, which are tiny little, like small plants that grow in the muskeg and they have tiny little leaves. And she would mix them with lard and make an, an ointment. I don't know what it was for. Maybe it was for infections or uh, cuts. I don't know. She used um, spruce gum. Spruce gum is... Uh, um, hard substance when it's on the tree but when it's taken down and she would melt it in a pot 
let it cool off a bit and it would be a, like a really sticky, gooey mixture. And she would put it on a cut and, and bandage it up and um, leave it for a few days, not even check it. And when she did un undo it, the bandage, the gum had done its job. The, the, the uh, wound will, would be healed, there'd be no infection. She used things, items from around the house, things like uh, uh, lard, um, baking, uh, not baking soda, um, uh, anyway, vanilla, jam for, for burns, uh, things like that that she had learned. And there was more, but I don't at, at the moment recall what they were. She had to do this, and other people in Gift Lake had to do this because the nearest hospital was two days away by horse and wagon. So unless there was a faster mode of transportation, which could be available, I mean, pe few people had vehicles, and but, you know, a trip to the hospital did not happen. Our nearest hospital was um, in High Prairie. Now, there there was a, a Catholic church mission in the at First Nations uh, reserve next door to Gift Lake. And a couple of nuns at that mission were actually trained nurses. And people put a lot of trust in them. They willingly uh, went to the mission with the expectation that they would get uh, medical treatment, what they needed, because they did have some medical supplies there. Um, I'm sure the nuns had some very challenging cases. I think they even pulled out teeth when they had to, but, and I, I'm sure that uh, they did more, more than they were trained to do. Uh, more than they were equipped to do, but they did what they could. That was how life was back then too. You worked with what you had and you tried your best to make it work. Mom treated flu, colds, stomach aches, um, nosebleeds, bee stings, um, I remember one time even a suspected poisoning. Um, I think it was my older brother Edward maybe that uh, I, I don't remember what he ate or drank but I remember the activity, the flurry of activity that happened to okay so what what did they do because uh, and I remember my Muslim Camille coming over and I remember Auntie Helen running over and Uncle Wilbert because we lived amongst aunts and uncles and my Muslim and Kokum and they determined that they would give him milk and I think they added a little bit of uh, dry mustard <laughs> A anyway, he, he, he survived. <laughs> so we, we don't know if the treatment worked or if he actually, what he ate was, uh, you know, likely to poison him. But that's how it was back then. People helped each other. I do remember kids having, um, we all did. We had uh, diseases that just don't seem to be around anymore. There's uh, vaccinations, but... I remember having, and the other kids, the older kids in my family having like mumps, uh, measles, chicken pox. I don't remember how mom treated that, but there was no trip to the hospital. I remember when I was about 10 years old. I believe, I be really believe that my mom saved my life that time. I was so sick. I was very sick. 
Every breath I took was sheer torture because every breath I took meant just severe pain from my chest right through to my back. And I was only taking, you know, shallow little breaths because each breath, like I said, it caused a lot of pain. And, and I couldn't even cry. It hurt too much to cry. And everyone, the older kids were going to a, a picture show that night. That's what we called movies and gift late. They were picture shows. And mom told me, oh, as soon as everybody leaves, I will fix you up. And I'm like, fix me now, I'm dying. <laughs> I really thought I was dying. Uh, so as soon as everyone left, she mixed up this bright yellow paste and she put um, a few cloths on the wood stove, the cook stove to, to, to warm up. And uh, she put the paste on my chest and on my back and then she would change over the warm cloth so there was one on me at all times. And I don't know how long she kept this up. But by the time the other kids came or got home from the picture show, I was in no pain. I was eating soup. And that's amazing, isn't it? And uh, <coughs> later on in life, I asked mom, what did I have that, that time? What kind of illness do you think I had? And she said, oh, I don't know, maybe pneumonia. <laughs> maybe it was really bad bronchitis. Um, I don't know. But I also asked her, and what was that yellow paste you put on me? And she said, oh, dry, dry mustard plaster. You can look it up on internet. It's there. I don't have time to talk to tell you tell you what that is, but yeah, it worked. Saved my life, I believe. And I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk tell about a couple of really serious cuts that happened. And Mom had no choice but to treat them. One day, Irvin and Larry, the two oldest boys in the family, were cutting wood um, with a Swede saw. Okay, a Swede saw is a, a long saw with blades all, all the way and a handle on each end of this blade. And it took two people moving it back and forth, back and forth to, cut, to, to saw the log. And they had to put it on a sawhorse. So someone had to sit on the log to keep it from like moving around while they cut it. So that day, um, my little brother Donald, he was uh, probably about four years old, maybe three. He, um, he was doing the honors. And I don't know what happened but he ended up with a big, big cut on the top of his foot. It was so huge. I'm sure today it would be a big rush trip to emergency and, and it would need like a good number of stitches. But mom just put her first aid medical expertise to use, uh, put peroxide on it, tied it, stop, stop the bleeding, put peroxide and, and bandaged it up and it healed just fine without a trip to the, um, the doctor or even the nurses in Whitefish. So another time, Donald, yeah, the same brother, chopped our older brother's hand, Edward, with an ax on purpose, on purpose. <laughs> Don was, he, Don was probably about seven, eight years old. 
and he was playing with an axe. He was playing with an axe. Anyway, we didn't know this was going on. They were both outside, but apparently uh, Edward was teasing him. Edward would go as close to him as he possibly could on his bike without actually running him down. And he did that a few times just to, you know, bug Donald. So Donald got very, very mad and he told him, he gave him fair warning. He told him, if you come here again, I'm gonna chop you. <laughs> I guess Edward didn't take him seriously. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, again there, there was a huge cut on, on Edward's hand, on the top of his hand like this. Um, and mom handled the crisis and, you know, Edward hand healed just fine. <laughs> I remember our oldest brother, Irvin, uh, went, out, went out to try and get Donald. And uh, seeing as Donald thought he was in a lot of trouble anyway, he told Irvin, if you'll come here, I'm going to chop you. <laughs> so I guess Irvin must have took him seriously. I don't know. I sure would. Uh, that was funny. There was a lot of uh, big panicky moments, but, you know, my mom just stayed calm. I remember there was a few times that she did panic and, and it was usually um, Musum Camille that she would uh, ask us to go and get. She somehow uh, thought, you know, he could help and he, he would come over. And uh, mom, like I mentioned earlier, practiced ongoing preventative medicine and she administered some of her uh, her poisons <laughs> her potions on a daily basis um i guess they were effective i mean we were healthy as children but i think in order to work they had to taste terrible you know something like that Buck buckley's commercial <laughs> It is awful, but it works. Buckley's is an old old medicine. It's an old cop medicine. Uh, we had it. When I was a kid, we occasionally had it when, when mom could afford it. One of the things that she, uh, mom, made us drink every winter, thankfully winter months only, we lined up in the morning to get our dose of cod liver oil. Cod liver oil. <sighs> oh my gosh, that was terrible. I, I, ugh, I can still remember the taste. And uh, uh, I don't know, years later, I also asked my mom, why did you put us through that torture anyway? And apparently uh, cod liver oil has some sunshine in it or something. <laughs> um, whatever. I think it was a residential school practice. <laughs> uh, I was really tiny. As a matter of fact, I was skinny as a child. And mom thought that I was lacking something. I think uh, Kokum Ladder would put that idea in her head that she needed to give me something. So she gave me a daily dose of what she called wampo. And it was a white pasty mixture similar to like Maalox. Yuck. I have since found out that wampo is a brand name for, uh, you know, a, a line of vitamins and milk and magnesia and things like that. And if, if uh, anybody remembers the uh, Watkins salespeople that used to come into sm small communities, I think that's where she got it, bought it. Anyway, I remember the Wampole bottle was tall, was big. 
and it was a very pretty color. It was royal blue. <laughs> but believe me, Mom, it wasn't wampole I was lacking. <laughs> Poor me. In the winter, I had to take wampole and cod liver oil. Oh, my gosh. For colds, bronchitis, pneumonia, uh, chest infections, um, I already talked about the dry mustard plaster, which she used rat root. I, I, I think she made some kind of a uh, thing on the stove with, with it, boiled it. Uh, I don't quite remember. Uh, aspirin, of course. We usually had aspirin because it was available at the Hudson Bay store in, in Whitefish. Uh, camperated oil. I remember electric oil. I, I don't know that if that was used for a cold, but I, I just remember that name. Gokum always had it. Uh, there was Vicks Vapor Rub. Uh, so, yeah, she would put it on our throat, on our chest, and on our back. But she, we also ate it. I don't know if you can eat it, but it sure soothed the throat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so anyway, we ate it. We survived. <laughs> um, if we complained of a stomach ache, we were sure that mom would prescribe something to clean out that would make us go to the bathroom because she believed in the concept of a regular cleansing of the system keeps illness at bay. I have since learned that the nuns gave the residential school children a regular dose of laxatives. So that's where she got that, that a theory that practice that she used on us so she used other you know a lot of different things castoria was actually good i like that i probably don't make it anymore castor oil i had looked for it one time just to see and i did find it a few years ago in a drugstore that i was looking uh, melted lard was taken internally Oil seemed to do wonders for a body. <laughs> um, and then there was the dreaded enema, and mom did not hesitate to use that. But anyway, let's move on. What more can I say about that? <laughs> um, one time we had scabies. Okay. So mom made a, a, a paste. There we go again. A paste of sulfur, which I didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it is, and lard. The mixture was lime green because I think the sulfur part of it was the green part. Okay, it was not too appetizing. Appetizing. Because we had to take probably a whole tablespoon of it. Uh, yes, mom didn't, didn't make us, uh, didn't use the sulfur mixture on our body we had to eat it and if she had rubbed it on us we would have been lime green anyway <laughs> that would have been fun <laughs> oh, crazy burns she would put like jam vanilla on the burn right away so it wouldn't scar i think it helped with the pain we didn't have running water but she would so uh put cold water on it anyway she wasn't able to run cold water on it like we do today um but it helped we did what we had to or she did what she had to nosebleed we got those quite often <laughs> she would tilt our head up and pat cold water on our top of our head like this and the other thing she did and I don't know why, what the purpose of it was, but she would tie a little uh, piece of cloth on each of our pinkies. Uh, I think it was done mostly to distract us from the blood, but you know, something like what a Band-Aid does for a child today. We didn't have Band-Aids. 
we never had band-aids. <laughs> we had little pieces of cloth. <laughs> babies, uh, babies uh, also took the adult medication. My mom gave the babies like adult medication like castoria or castor oil um, because they didn't have, uh, they didn't have baby aspirin. Uh, no, they had baby aspirin. I actually remember that. They, but they didn't have like all these baby uh, medications. They have like baby Tylenol, baby Advil, baby strain, uh, dosages. Um, they just got, she just gave them less. And I don't know, I think parents would freak out today <laughs> if you try to give them their baby and uh, adult medication. Uh, babies didn't get chest colds very often because it was a practice to put um, a cloth, like a bib or something, or just a cloth un under their undershirt, hmm. under their undershirt, <laughs> under their onesie, I think they call them today. Um, especially during the teething stages because this kept the baby's chest dry at all times. So that helped with, you know, not getting the chest colds. I did that with my babies. Um, flour was browned for, for uh, to, uh, a baby powder. Um, it prevented rash. Another household product was uh, cornstarch, which I used for my baby, my babies. So yeah, if you run out, go to your cupboard. Hopefully you have cornstarch. <laughs> um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some rather strange remedies. Uh, you may have heard of some of these, but for those who haven't, here we go. You might, you'll probably laugh. Um, did you know that you could buy a wart from someone and it disappears? So money talked <laughs> towards anyway. It's weird, but it really worked for us. Uh, maybe it was because we believed it would work. It was mostly our uncles that would buy the wart from us, my mom's brothers. And, you know, for a penny, maybe a nickel. But I'm sure if you're in the market for a wart today, it would cost you more than that. <laughs> Maybe a loony or a toony. <laughs> um, also, a white horse without the night <laughs> um, would work. If you if you went and rubbed the wart on the white horse, it would disappear. Now, I, I don't think we ever tried that. This is a really strange notion, but here it goes. And you know what? I actually saw my mom do this. And if my mom did it, I believe it worked. For a sore throat, tie a dirty sock, preferably your own, <laughs> around your neck. <laughs> I don't know. Try it. Nothing else works. <laughs> um, for wing, ring, eh, ring worm. Okay, ring worm. If you, um, to get rid of the ringworm, get fresh, steaming, hot, right out of the source, horse crap. Uh-huh. You just uh, take a, 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 a piece of it on a cloth, and while it's warm, you put it on the affected area, and it's supposed to uh, disappear. Now, one time, my older sister, Pauline, and I, followed a uh, doll around. He was our wagon horse and waiting for her to take a crap. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like a long time. It, maybe it wasn't, but I, I, don't, I don't remember if we achieved our goal. <laughs> uh, this one I actually tried a couple of years ago on Manutim. Um, 
for a headache. I'll call this uh, the potato head treatment. <laughs> for a headache, you slice a potato and you place the slices along around on your forehead. You tie a cloth around and you lay down. Now, after your headache is gone, um, maybe you can fry potatoes for supper. <laughs> Don't let anything go to waste. <laughs> ja. <laughs> um, so yes, I did try this on my Nochim and, and it, I don't know if it was coincidence or it worked, but he fell asleep after I put the potatoes on his head and he, he woke up, headache was gone. I mean, he was a tough little guy, barely cried, you know, from pain. He would just be a, like a tough it out little guy, but he actually was crying from this headache. So I had to do something and I didn't know what, so I, I thought of that. And I'm like, and I prayed for him. So that was, that was awesome. I only remember three hospitalizations that happened. And, and there was uh, 10 children in my family. There was only three times that someone ended up in the hospital. I was one of them. I was in a life-threatening accident when I was four years old, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, my brother, younger brother, Dennis, he had some kind of a stomach infection. And my younger sister, Joyce, broke her arm. And those are the only three times that all of us were, were born at home, except for the oldest. He was born at the Hyper Hospital, but the rest of us, Nine of us were born at home. One was even born in a tent out where they were uh, making hay or something. <laughs> My older brother was born in a tent. <laughs> um, but we were healthy children. We had a healthy diet. We didn't have junk food or a lot of sugars. No access, couldn't afford them. Our, in the summer, our, our our snacks came right out of the garden. We ate right out of the garden for meals too. Um, our diet from the wild was, uh, you know, meat it was healthy, I guess. Um, and we had a lot of exercise, a lot of exercise. We ran around and played from morning till night. And so, yeah, we, we were healthy as children. Uh, we had the, you know, regular, uh, colds and some of those childhood diseases I talked about but other than that we were all good mom was a good doctor and if we had to the nurses were in whitefish anyway I hope you enjoyed this story and I hope you tune in again Igose Maga